Leadership Story Talks, where we discuss the practices that engage, motivate, develop, retain, and attract people to businesses. We'll give you principles and tools based on real-world stories to leverage listening and storytelling to become a better leader and management professional. Leadership Story Talks is produced by Narrative, a company that focuses on personal storytelling for business. Welcome to Leadership Story Talks. I'm Jerome DeRoy, CEO of Narrative. And I'm Julian Ryan. So happy <laughs> hey, to be Jules. here. Jules, <laughs> almost, almost forgot who you were there. <laughs> I know, I was waiting for a big intro, but I guess not. We'll keep it simple. <laughs> Keeping it simple today. Um, so today we have a great guest. Her name is Pernilla Rorso, who specializes in national and organizational culture from a performance risk perspective. So that's both in terms of KPIs and bottom line results, as well as people development, engagement, satisfaction, engagement, that's certainly our key word. And one of the reasons that we're, we're having you on, on the show today. Um, Pernilla is the managing director of Copenhagen office and senior business consultant at Hofstede Insights and is a PhD fellow. Pernilla is actively involved in cross-border M&As, leadership development, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion, another area that we talk a lot about on our podcast, in addition to cultural areas related to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There is much more I could say, but uh, we're going to get into it in this, in this show. So Pernilla, uh, welcome, and, and I know you're coming all the way from Denmark, so really, really glad to have, to have you on the show and to take the time for this. Thank so, you, Jerome. Yeah. You're, you're very welcome. Um, so why don't we, uh, you know, launch with um, the first question here, which is, could, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to do what you're doing at Hofstede Insights? Because it's quite unique to me, uh, mm -hmm. certainly, and I, and I would think for our listeners as well. And a little bit of what it is to just some background context. I mm -hmm. think that'd be helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, how should I start? Well, um, I studied international business. And during my studies, I was introduced to Professor Geert Hofstede. He's Dutch, or he was Dutch. Unfortunately, he passed away around two years ago, right before Corona. And I was fascinated by it because Hofstede, and maybe I should tell you a little bit about him. Mm, he sure. used to work, yeah, he used to work for IBM and um, in the Netherlands. And IBM asked him to do this employee survey on, uh, on a lot of different parameters amongst all of IBM's subsidiaries around the world. And when they got all the questionnaires back, he noticed something very interesting. He noticed that the way, for instance, the Americans and Italians and Germans and so on had answered the same questions differed significantly mm -hmm. and systematically. And he wondered why that was, because it couldn't be due to the fact that IBM had different organizational cultures among all their locations, the different subsidiaries, because IBM has a very strong organizational culture. It's the same everywhere. And it couldn't be due to the fact that um, they, were, uh, they were comparing uh, engineers with assistants and so on from the different countries, because the questionnaires were all matched, the results. So he wondered and wondered what might cause the differences in answers. And then suddenly struck him that the differences in the answers had to be due to the differences in the national cultures the, the employees came from, originated mm -hmm. from, and the rest is history. So what he discovered was that we can actually measure countries according to their cultural values. Mm -hmm. And he discovered six, six cultural dimensions. And I got so fascinated by this, but during my studies that when I started working afterwards, I, I kept thinking about it and I really wanted to do more with this. And then at some point I was working as a manager and in international business, it was wonderful, but I sort of wanted to specialize in the culture part. And yeah, then I sort of reached out and the rest is history, as they say. And I started specializing in this kind of research and the practical application of it. Mm. You know, it's it's fascinating the that sort of discovery piece. Um, you, you look at all the parameters, and and there's nothing else that could explain why people's answers would differ. And then you you find out, or Hofstadter finds out, you know, that it's all about that national culture and those uh, differences, which. Uh, 
seem very apparent in everyday life, right? If you travel uh, at all, um, you know, you'll immediately recognize, oh, that's, and that's kind of how we even look at the world. Uh, and I don't know if this, maybe you could tell me, I wonder if that's a French trait, <laughs> because what I've <laughs> noticed, because I was born in, in France and, um, and grew up there, and when I traveled through France and then other countries, you know, I always noticed, and I've always wondered if that was a French trait or not, but you tend to compare. You're like, oh, you know, oh, they, that's interesting. They have a little cafe here. Oh, we do things a little differently. That's not how we serve that, or that's not what we would say to someone when we give it to someone, you know, and it's always compared to, uh, you know, the culture that you're coming from, essentially. And that's, yeah. it seems like something that's just um, ingrained in all of us, because I certainly notice it in many, many people from different nationalities. And so it's interesting that something that I think we kind of know intuitively, mm -hmm. um, you know, that that would be a discovery in the world of, of business. Um, you know, it, it's both interesting and not so surprising, I guess. But um, I wonder what you think about that. The, the, the idea that, you know, this is something we walk around with a lens and that national culture is deeply ingrained and it's how I view the world. And then once I start to be exposed to other cultures, I sort of notice those differences just naturally. Uh, but here, this was something that was necessary to codify in a way for the business world, it sounds like. Yeah, definitely. And, and the fact that we can actually measure it is incredible because this is, a, you can say, a quantitative approach. We can measure it quantitatively, national culture. Mm. So, it's really cultural value dimensions we're talking about. Before then, you can say what's really a paradigm shift with Hofstede, because before then, there was more of an insider perspective, more from an anthropological perspective. So where you go and study a culture and uh, in it by itself, and it's so unique. But what Hofstede discovered was that you could actually compare different cultures on the same dimensions, because all cultures have to figure out, for instance, um, who makes decision in this society. And it doesn't matter if you're in France or you're in the Amazons or wherever you are, but you ha still have to figure out how are we going to organize ourselves, who will make decisions and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's only learned. So we learn it from the day almost we're born. We're programmed. That's how Hofstede would call it. According to him, national culture is the same as the collective programming of the human mind by which one group differs from another group. So um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Does that answer your question or? Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think it does. I, I noticed Jules, you, you had your, your pen Yeah, <laughs> I'm just curious, do you have, it, you can't simplify this in the sense, it's, it's very interesting, like maybe an example that would bring that to light, a comparison of maybe American, what would be a, just an example that comes to mind of a corporate person with an executive, maybe assistant reporting to him working with some another country, a Japanese yeah, country. Actually, if you take France as an example, France and the US, you would find that one of the cultural dimensions that's power distance and power distance in France is higher than it is in the US. And that also creates a situation where the leader has a different role. Mm. In, the two, uh, in the two cultures. Another thing you can say that's different between the two cultures is that where Americans on average, we're talking about on average, general tendencies when we talk about culture, they live to work. The French, they work to live. So that's another uh, difference. And that, that also tells you something about motivation in the different cultures. Um, is it management by objectives or not? Um, and so on, yeah. Mm. Are target deadlines very important in a culture or is, is it something else that's more important like flexibility, free time, good relationships with colleagues and so on that are the primary motivators. So it tells you a lot about work mm. life, yeah, in different cultures. Yeah, yeah, it, it's fascinating. And I wonder if, you know, you've seen an evolution in the last few years, because you mentioned flexibility might be important to some and, you know, more than others. And, and obviously, because of COVID, you know, in the yeah. pandemic, we, we've had to suddenly really change everything and be very flexible. And now I just read yesterday, uh, an article about, um, I think it was like the, the title was that, uh, you know, company executives are becoming desperate now 
and they're they're asking a little more forcefully, at least here in the U.S., um, for people to come back to to the office. Uh, whether you know maybe not full time, but at least three days a, a week, and it's becoming more urgent. Uh, and there's a lot of resistance to that from employees. And so I'm wondering, in terms of you know these cultural dimensions that you look at, um, whether these evolve over time. You know, is it because is, is the programming fixed? I guess. <laughs> Um, well, it, they do change, but they change very slowly. Mm. And it takes several generations for things mm. to shift. But what we can say is that the, the second dimension is individualism versus collectivism. And the US is the most individualist culture in the world. Mm. And you can say, we know that that goes up. So all cultures are moving upwards on this dimension. So that means becoming more individualist but you still have the majority of the countries in the world are collectivist, but still everyone it's moving up. So for instance, in the US, you also see that people become more individualist. That's mm -hmm. one thing. It's very strongly correlated to wealth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have, for instance, power distance, which is higher also in the majority of the countries in the world. And of course, if you have a very high power distance, you just tell people come back to the office and they're gonna do it. That is not the case when you have a lower power distance. And the US has a medium low power distance. You still have a power distance, but it's not so high. So uh, it's dif more difficult to get people to come back in, in the US, for instance, compared to a lot of other countries where they would just do as they're told to be. Yeah, to be precise, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure generations have a, a bit to do with that too where somebody is in their career and age as well about how they're interpreting that. yeah I mean, national cultural programming is only one small part of the programming of any individual people have their personalities they have uh, there's also professional culture there's an organizational culture everything plays a role but you can say national culture runs the deepest mm -hmm. um, and it's more or less in place by the age of 10. So it really runs deep. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder how you see, you know, the, the role of, of leaders um, in, in terms of looking at these cultural dimensions. And I like, is there something that in your experience leaders need to pay attention to and it, traditionally or historically, maybe they haven't, um, or it's something that, someone might take for granted in your, you know, in your, in your capacity as, as the expert on this issue and looking at these dimensions very, very specifically, are you able to sort of say, here's something you're not, you're not seeing, uh, and this is why you're seeing these, um, you know, these interactions in this way that, that maybe aren't working or, or, or whatever it might be. I, I wonder if there's something that you've noticed as a kind of a pattern uh, where, where people tend to miss something fairly regularly? Well, with culture, first of all, it's quite fuzzy. So they don't mm. really know what it's all about and it's intangible to many people, but it doesn't have to be. As I said, we measure these things and yeah, that's data, right? But uh, one of the things is that, well, they underestimate cultural differences and thinking that we all become the same, you know, the, the world, yes, it becomes, I would say more globalized, but in the in the sense of more interconnected. And the more interactions we have across the world, the more we come into contact with other cultures. And we're actually being more, uh, we meet cultural differences much more and that's just gonna increase. And then there are of course some, some issues that pop up all the time. Like I said, for the majority of the countries in the world, power distance is high. And for the majority of the countries in the world, they are also collectivist. So for instance, if a company outsources from, uh, from the US to let's say a country like the Philippines or something like that, or Indonesia, you will run into some specific problems. And, or we can also take India, where you, know, you have indirect communication, China, you have a concept of face and underestimating how important it is to be able to manage across these situations, especially this thing with direct, indirect communication is, is very, very important to be aware of. And I can't even, I can't even count how many business deals have been lost, gone down the drain because these differences aren't acknowledged and managed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
it, it, it's fascinating to me these uh, these differences. I think because of of um, the way I grew up, but also what you see in the world now. Um, you know, it, we we live in I think by many accounts a hybrid world. I mean, we're talking to you right now in in Denmark. You know, despite the the time difference, the technology is is bringing us together, and you know, companies have leveraged that. Uh, really in a big way in the last few years. And then that all accelerated with the pandemic. And, and I wonder, you know, given this new kind of paradigm, what, how has your work changed? Like, what, what, are you, what are the things that you're now needing to pay attention to for your clients that perhaps wasn't an issue, uh, you know, a few years ago? Well, one thing, of course, is that when you you have a hybrid world, you know, something becomes easier when you're online and some things become more difficult. So, uh, and, and so you can't, it, I mean, it, it's a trap you can say because people think, okay, now everything is online and we can just send emails and we can have video meetings and, and, and things like that, but, or Teams meetings, Zoom meetings, so what? But uh, it, it, you still have, see the differences and sometimes it even exaggerated the differences because even though with the best connection, you know, you, it's more difficult to pick up on nonverbal communication. On the other hand, you also move a lot over, for instance, you have discussion boards and that creates a situation where people can write and they can go back and reflect and things like that. So it's all about matching technology with the task in the right way and also taking the cultural differences into perspective, I would say. So there are opportunities and uh, there are drawbacks as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, interesting, Jules. Yeah. I wonder what your, uh, what your take on that is because that, that connects nicely with your own the theme of your own book and you know communications and communication i live it every day with my husband not from here and, and what english is different no matter you know where you grew up and the inferences so i was scrolling back and unpacking memories of uh, one company i worked to where a lot of our workforce we were dealing with was england and scotland and there were some italians so we made it really interesting on the international calls but i remember my mind of they have this visual of seeing this email coming from the uk and it was a work of art it was elaborate it was detailed it was beautiful it's you know, about different steps the american response okay got it <laughs> it was like and it wasn't like if somebody on the other side was like, is that the best you can do? Is that all the intellect you're going to drum up to respond? So I, you know, I wondered about like nuances matter, kind of responding in uh, meeting the person halfway, I think is a big thing. And then the assumptions, because you and I originally met through supply chain. You know, you were one of the instructors that we had um, from a global platform teaching people on the procurement side who are outsourcing to Asia, that were looking for vendors all over the world to how to step out of their assumptions and build relationships with on the ground resources and how to get out of their own way. So I just wonder maybe some of the, the practical examples of what you've been able to coach um, a company or an individual, I think would be quite helpful for the listeners. Well, definitely. And I, I very often you can say, well, let me start with that. You have cultures that are much more, they need much more detail than other cultures. And that comes, that that is related to the fourth dimension, uncertainty avoidance. So some cultures they are taught, or people in some cultures are taught to have, a, have more tolerance for uncertainty. And than others, and they need much more predictability. So of course, you will see these long agendas in some cultures and very short agendas where people really, if they get a lot of information, it's like over information overload. But on the other hand, the other people will feel if they don't, if they get a reply, like you were talking about, they're gonna feel like this is, where is all the information I need? So, but yeah, I what we do, I mean, you can say um, educating global leaders is one thing. So, mm -hmm. so they'd be able to manage uh, a lot of multicultural teams. That's one thing. That's something I very often do. Um, and, and, and supply chain management is of course one of them. And that is one thing is to teach people about risk management because mm -hmm. this is also related to this um, dimension. 
that people in different cultures, they have been programmed or learned to view risk differently. So what is considered a large risk and what is considered a smaller risk? And when should such a risk be escalated? When should it be, um, how should it be managed? It could be managed in different ways and it will be managed in different ways. That's one example of how uh, we, uh, the, some of the cases we work with or I work with. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Mergers and acquisitions, another one. But that, then it's both national culture and organizational culture. And they're going in and, and measuring the organizational culture, actually, um, when you have, you know, a merger or an acquisition and then realizing, OK, how does the national culture impact as well? So, yeah, that's what we do. And then, of course, organizational culture, you can change. You can't change national culture. You have to take it into consideration, be aware of it know how much you need to adapt, bridge national cultures, but you cannot change it. It changes, but it changes very slowly. Organizational culture, on the other hand, you can change. So it supports mm. your strategy best. Yes. Mm. I don't know, does that answer your question or? It does in part. And I'm just saying, is there is there an, uh, maybe just an example from your case studies of something you were able to coach an organization or, or a manager or somebody with their team through so they were much more aware going forward? Well, one of the things I've done recently is working on setting up a whole, um, you can see, uh, you could say a uh, what do you say, like a framework for how they work internationally with multicultural teams, how they build that up. And that starts from the awareness to which tools they will use. For instance, okay, so you can take an example. So, so what's important, and that's both for individualist and collectivist cultures, that in the virtual environment, you need to build trust. Mm. Otherwise, it's not going to work. People are just going to be spread out. You're going to have not, people are going to be, uh, you're not going to have the information knowledge sharing whatsoever that you're expecting if people don't know each other. So, okay, so then we go in and then we work with, okay, so how do we develop trust? And that will be different for people from individualist cultures and collectivist cultures who set up a framework together with the client that fits their organization and their organizational culture on how are we going to make this you know, a successful, the ideal multicultural team with people spread out all over the world. And I've mm -hmm. just do, I've just done that. And it will be things like, how are we gonna communicate? How do we build trust? How do we, um, how do we uh, mm, welcome new team members? How, what is the procedure for exiting, you know, for team members exiting and, and a lot of things, you know? Mm. So if, yeah, that's just one example. It's it's very um, far reaching as well as specific. Uh, interestingly, because it, it's uh, this whole conversation so far, I, I think is very is going to be very illuminating for a lot of people. Because as you said very early on, culture can be seen as this sort of fuzzy thing that's that's hard to define. And it's fascinating to me how much um, you've actually defined. <laughs> and you know, there's these six cultural dimensions. And, and now I'm wondering about the organizational dimensions. And one of the things that we talked about, um, you know, in, in the first time we met Pranilla was the, the difference between stated values in an organization and enacted values. And that's something that we talk a lot about with Jules, uh, you know, both on the show and in our work, because a lot of our clients come to us and with this issue of, you know, we've got these fantastic values but they don't seem to be landing or we're not really using them. And a lot of our work is to use storytelling to kind of bring those to life, right? Um, and I wonder in, in your work, because we talked about this, paying attention to the difference between stated values and enacted values. Why, why is that important to you and to, to your work? Well, it's first of all, we have to distinguish between national culture and organizational culture mm. because they're not the same thing. And we use different dimensions to measure them. When we talk about national culture, we primarily talk about values. So for instance, what, what is a value? That's something that is important to, uh, to someone. For instance, is it moral or immoral to help someone in your family get employed with your organization? 
clearly in some cultures that would be very immoral. In other cultures, it would be immoral not to do so. So that's what we're really talking about when we talk about values and national culture, primarily values. When we talk about organizational culture, and I'll get back to your question just in a, in a few seconds uh, here, we are primarily talking about practices. So the way people, they react to their work or the relationship between people and their work and other colleagues, the organization and the world at large outside. That's organizational culture. And there we're primarily talking about practices. You can say it's really ideal behavior. What is seen as ideal behavior in this organization? And that will be the, the stated values. So for instance, corporate values, core values, um, customer focus, that would be organizational culture. That would be, for instance, um, we view as as ideal behavior to put the customer first. That would primarily be a practice. So the ways of doing things and they, they can change, we can change them. And when then you talk about enacted values, well, that behavior can actually be quite different, the actual behavior from what the stated behavior, ideal behavior is. And for that, you really need to measure organizational culture to know, and then also to know how should we change it? What should the optimal organizational culture or the optimal practices, the optimal behavior be to support our strategy and the stated values, if that makes mm. sense. So it's really, when we talk about values from a corporate perspective, we talk about practices, the so ways of behavior. And when we talk about national culture, we are talking about much more deep-seated values you can see emotional preferences in a way mm -hmm. yeah you know i i'm it's just bringing to my mind again this this issue that seems to be all over the place now about you know do people need to come back and work at, in an office or can we keep the way things are do we need to be hybrid etc this question just seems to be coming back and one of the i was talking to someone the other day who was saying that one of the big issues in his company was that nobody stated why a decision was made around remote work, hybrid work, or in-office work. It's just a policy. There, nobody said why this was happening. And as a result, his theory was that there's a lot of resistance because nobody knows really the, yeah. the, the argument, essentially, or hasn't heard the argument for it um, beyond what's written in the, in the newspapers, et cetera. And I wonder, you know, now that we're talking about values, enacted values, stated values, you know, I wonder if that's also the issue uh, here is that, you know, you're not connecting a decision that's a really big decision for your employees and, and is probably going to have ramifications for a long time in terms of their well-being, mental health and all of that and productivity. Um, you know, and, and I wonder if there isn't a disconnect there as well that, you know, not only have people not stated why they're taking a, a position, but also they may be not didn't look at the values that are stated, those that are enacted, and also how those might have evolved because of what's happened in the last three, four years. Um, yeah. I don't really have a question there, but it's more of a reflection <laughs> and a comment on what you were saying, because that's very present in my mind, this thing that we're trying to get people to do without necessarily saying, you know, well, what's the reason for it? And of course there's resistance and how do we, how do we manage that conversation? Context, I think, is the favorite word always. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I would, I would totally. This is also a comment. I know it wasn't a question, but this is. <laughs> I will totally agree with that. It's so important to explain why providing the rationale for something, and the way you do it then is is different in different cultures, of course. But it's very important. And I would also say, when we talk about this thing with the stated values and enacted values, which I refer to as practices, as behavior or ideal behavior, is it, what is really optimal in the situation for companies or corporation strategy? That you can find out because you know what the strategy is. Okay, then you can understand, okay, what should the culture be like? What should be the structure be like? Because these are very related. They have an impact on each other. So I wouldn't even go there unless I had measured the organizational culture and identified the optimal culture. Then you also have the reason why that you can communicate. Mm -hmm. You know, that I think is probably the best um, explanation I've heard or, or the best um, 
practice I've heard because I think that's also what stops people is like, well, you're telling me to tell you why, but I don't even know where to start in terms of how to even state the rationale behind it. Um, and I think looking at what the optim optimal culture, cultural environment is, and then linking that to strategy, I think that's a, just such a, it makes a lot of sense. And, and it's a great kind of insight um, for, for our listeners, I think. What do you think, Jules? I think invest, and I th well, I'm speaking for us and making a blanket assumption on our culture that we can, we err on the side of speedy and assumptions that everyone is like us, which is not always the case, especially if you're from New York. Um, and I think because these things help us, they can hurt us. We, we, we were all coming up with very short staccato answers yes or no and not elaborate and not investing time at the front end for the relationship like what is what's your language like or what's your communication and you and i have talked in the past about yes that simple word when i was managing in a situation where the culture group said yes to me as a leader and i went oh they said yes we're moving forward they understand they're going to go do something but it was a different kind of yes it was we heard you we know who you are and all good. So, it, and then had to revisit and recontract what yes meant. So it was a very interesting thing to think about, about how much conflict or back and forth or, you know, challenge relations happen because we don't invest enough time and we, we have assumptions. We try to do too quick. We try to do in like little uh, verbal haiku, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have, uh, I'm looking at the time here and I have one last uh, question and then a, a comment. I wanna make sure we leave our, our listeners with some uh, resources as well, because this has been so fascinating and I feel like we could, we could, we could go on for a long time. Um, but uh, but I, I'd like to ask you the question that we ask all our guests, uh, Pranilla, uh, which is to tell us about a time that has shaped who you are today. It's an event, a moment, something, a relationship, whatever it might be that, that still kind of informs, you know, how you think and informs your decisions? Well, I think that's a really great question. And of course there are lots, or maybe not lots, but there are several of such, um, yeah, incidents you can say. And, um, but I would probably say that when I, I started my international business studies, when I started uh, the bachelor first, because I'm multicultural myself. So I was always used to, I'm half Swedish, half Danish. Well, I also have distant American relatives, but I was sort of used to, in all cultures, you can say, not really being completely from that culture, being different, you can mm -hmm. say. And at that time, especially between Denmark and Sweden going forward, I, I sort of maybe felt that it was a little bit of a liability. But then as I started the international business program, I met a lot of people like myself that had multicultural backgrounds that all had an in international interest and a whole different world opened up to me. So instead of sort of thinking of myself as being a little bit flawed, trying to fit in, oh, I'm not really, you know, mm -hmm. a person from this country, I'm not really a person from that country, um, then I just felt, wow, this is such a strength. And I felt at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that really changed who I am today. And I love everything international. So, uh, but yeah, it changed my per whole perspective from feeling I have to adapt completely. Uh, uh, it's a liability. I should downtone this uh, aspect of me, this other country or culture to seeing it as a, as a, really a big strength. You learn story tours and how you visit people, whether it's your relatives, your friends in the different cultures. So you always had to have to ad adapt your lens and in how information was being shared or received. Yeah. With yeah, and also, definitely, and I also think that when we are uh, young, it's very important to feel part of a group. You know, when we're teenagers, when we're young, when you're you really want to feel part of the group. And that's why I guess you, you really try to adapt so much and you downplay maybe the sides that, you know, I always knew there was something, I had a different, you know, 
perspective yeah. as well, but I sort of downplayed it when I was in one country and then, you know, vice versa. So, but all of a sudden, you know, I met, yeah, it was a whole different world opening up to me. Mm. It's a great, it's a great answer because um, what you're, what you're alluding to here is that sense of belonging. And when you, when you find that somewhere, uh, it, it just really changes everything. It changes your perspective on everything. And, and I feel like it's, it's, a, it's also a great, um, it's something to leave our listeners with in, in terms of these conversations as well. How, how can I, in my, if I have any control over my environment um, and my organization and my team in particular, how do we create that sense of belonging? And I, and I think so many of these uh, insights that you offer, these dimensions, whether it's cultural or organizational, can be really helpful. Um, and, and I see that just from this short conversation, which I, I wish could be could be longer. <laughs> so um, th thank you so much. It's a, it's a great answer. And uh, maybe just to, to conclude here, um, are there any um, any thoughts or, or maybe even practical, uh, you know, links or resources that people can go to to learn more about your work and Hofstede in, in particular? Uh, well, I, I have said insights have a web page and mm. uh, you can also uh, link up with me on LinkedIn because I'm going to put a lot of articles and resources there. So that's okay. probably the, and of course, Hops Data has written books as well so that you can pick up, of course. Um, but I would also say, uh, yeah, yeah, I would, yeah, I would probably say that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to weigh in as somebody who had the good fortune of not just meeting Purnell, but also taking two of her workshops some time ago. And I just, I'm biased in my own way, but I think it should be required for everybody who's working in a company or organization. That in our classes too, by the way, but this would be such a sea change to have. So I encourage you to look at it and really, do. and they're fun and interesting. And they they just stay with you, and it, it you we learn every day, and it's always evolving. But yeah, I do recommend, highly recommend them, and I don't say that lightly. Mm. Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. so sweet. Thank you so much, Jules. <laughs> I, I echo that sentiment. Uh, I haven't known you as long, but uh, but this has been really fascinating and and uh, just so helpful because of all the practical. Um, you know, nuances about, about your work. So uh, I really encourage everyone who's listening to, uh, to go to the, to the website, Hofstede Insights, and, and we will put into our show's notes um, everything else that Pernil has alluded to in terms of, you know, where we can find links and resources that might be helpful to people. Uh, so look out for that. And uh, with that, I, I really want to thank you very much, Pernilla, for, for joining us. And, uh, you know, despite the time difference, I know it's a little, it's getting a little later where you are. So, um, so we'll let you go soon. Um, and, uh, and thanks, you know, to you, Jules, as well. And, and of course, I, I want to thank our, our listeners and our audience uh, for listening today and, and say that if you've been inspired by this session, uh, and perhaps other episodes that you've listened to, you can join us on September 7th. Uh, when we're going to begin our, our three-part online workshop series. You can go to the website. It's narrative.com, N-A-R-A-T-I-V.com. Under resources, you'll find the workshop there, and you can register. You can learn more about how you can find, craft, and tell a powerful leadership story of your own in a safe and supportive environment over the course of three one-hour sessions. Uh, and who knows, maybe you'll learn a lot about cultural differences because it's open to anyone in the world. Um, so, so thanks so much, yeah. And if you prefer to have a private session or for one-on-one -on -one and your teams to really work on specific issues that are tailored to your needs, you know we will talk to you. We're always here to listen. So thank you. Thank you, Pranilla. Thank you, Jerome. It's always thank interesting you. as we globe trot around the world. And uh, till we see each other again. Yes, yes. And uh, everyone, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review on your favorite podcast platform, and know that this is also going to be on YouTube. Um, so whenever you can drive the word of mouth, you can send people uh, to that favorite platform and tell them about Leadership Story Talks. So until next time, thanks so much, Jules, for co-hosting. And thanks, Pernilla, for being here. And we'll see you next time. Happy listening. Cheers. For more information on the narrative listening and storytelling method and how it can help your business, go to narrative.com.